Welcome, and thank you for attending this School Nurse Professional Development online training. This is topic four in a five-part series. This training will cover asthma and allergic rhinitis. Highmark Foundation, in collaboration with Penn State Pro Wellness, is pleased to offer this professional development opportunity for school nurses. Between fall 2015 and fall 2016, this collaborative effort will result in five online professional development trainings utilizing physician experts to address select topics identified by school nurses. The first three trainings dealing with dermatology, mental health, and diabetes are now available. The last in this five-part series will cover food allergies and is slated to release in October 2016. Please note, the information provided in this web series should not be used during any medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. A licensed medical professional should be consulted for diagnosis and treatment of any and all medical conditions. Please call 911 for all medical emergencies. Links to other sites are provided for information only. They do not constitute endorsement of those sites. My name is Pamela Witt, and I am a project coordinator for Penn State Pro Wellness. Joining me is Dr. Deborah Gentile. Dr. Gentile is currently Professor of Medicine at Temple University School of Medicine and Director of Clinical Research in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Allegheny Health Network in Pittsburgh. She is past president of the Pennsylvania Allergy and Asthma Association and the Pittsburgh Allergy Society and a member of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Dr. Gentile is also a member of the Healthy Air Collaborative and a board member of the American Lung Association of Western Pennsylvania and For Your Good Health, a local nonprofit that conducts asthma screens and sports camps for underserved children. She is on the editorial board of the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and performs grant reviews for the Department of Defense. And now a bit of information about Penn State Pro Wellness. Pro Wellness is committed to educating and inspiring youth and their families to eat well, engage in regular physical activity, and become champions for bringing healthy choices to life. We aim to be the trusted resource for educational programming, collaborative partnerships, and proven interventions in over 400 schools, communities, and like-minded organizations. PRO, Prevention, Research, and Outreach. Examples of our work based on this acronym can be found on our website. Our website also has many resources, including the opportunity to sign up your school or a community-based organization to be a healthy champion. One of the many ways we accomplish this is through our school-based Healthy Champions program. If you are not yet enrolled in our Healthy Champions program, we do hope you will consider enrollment. This program includes free resources like event planning guides and promotional templates, customized school champion reports, future funding priorities, so you'll hear about funding opportunities first, and tools and resources to host and promote four annual events promoting healthy meals, healthy snacks, and outdoor play. These events include Apple Crunch, Go for the Greens, Move It Outside, and Walk to School Day. Annual registration is open April through June for the following school year and is required in order to receive a welcome kit and web portal password in September. There is no limit on how many schools can enroll, so please log on to our website to read more details about the program. Dr. Gentile, thank you for lending your expertise on as asthma and allergic rhinitis. Welcome everyone and thank you for attending. Today we're going to focus on asthma and allergic rhinitis. An overview of asthma. Asthma is a very common disease. It currently affects 27 million Americans. 
It's a chronic disease that causes airways to become inflamed, and in turn, that makes it very difficult to breathe. Many patients who have asthma describe it as trying to breathe through a straw. Um, that's how difficult it is. It's important to realize that there is no cure for asthma, but fortunately, it can be managed and controlled. There's a variety of ways to control and manage asthma. The first one is to avoid triggers, and we're going to talk about this in detail throughout the presentation. The second is to actually take your medications to prevent symptoms, and we'll also discuss this in detail. And the third thing is to prepare to treat asthma episodes if they do occur. And we're going to walk through the details of an asthma action plan and how to do this. Asthma is very prevalent. Currently in the United States, 1 in 14 people have asthma, and approximately 6.3 million children have asthma. It's a leading chronic disease in childhood. It's actually one of the number one reasons why children miss school. And this is very important because if the children are missing school, they're not learning well, and this could impact upon their ability later to get into college or even to get a job. The other thing is if they're missing school, they're often not interacting well with their peers, so they have some social disadvantages. And also, they're not able to participate in sports and activities as well as others. So it really does have a large impact upon their life. Um, again, it's the top reason for missed school days. And we're going to talk a bit later about disparities, including racial and socioeconomic disparities. But the asthma rate is about 50% higher in the United States in African Americans than in whites. And a lot of that disease is clustered in inner city areas. And again, we'll review that later on in the talk. Unfortunately, um, asthma is associated with morbidity as well as mortality. This slide just reviews some of the major points of asthma morbidity. About 14 million annual doctor visits occur in the U.S. each year because of asthma. And there are about 2 million annual emergency room visits each year. Now, many of these emergency room visits and acute visits to the doctor's office can be avoided if patients are on appropriately, I'm sorry, if they're on appropriate control or medication. There's also about a half a million annual hospitalizations. And again, these could be avoided in most patients if they're on controllers. The average length of a hospital stay is 3.6 days, and it costs in the tens of thousands of dollars for each admission. Um, asthma is actually the third leading cause of hospitalization, and African Americans are three times more likely to be hospitalized due to an asthma exacerbation than whites. It's very unfortunate, but we still do have deaths from asthma each year. And it's very unfortunate because we do have good medicines that can prevent fatal attacks in most people. Unfortunately, about 10 Americans die every day in the U.S. from asthma. And that totals up to about 3,630 deaths a year that could be prevented. It's a myth that only patients with severe asthma die of asthma. There have been several studies done that have shown that the deaths occur equally among the different severities. And we'll go through the severity levels a bit later on, but some patients are classified as having mild disease, others moderate, and others severe. And the prevalence of the death rate is actually similar in all three groups. Um, the underlying feature is usually lack of control or medication and not having an asthma action plan to follow. So the bottom line is, unfortunately, there's deaths, but we could prevent these if we, we get people on the medications that they need. Asthma also costs a lot of money, both directly for medical costs as well as indirectly for missed school and work. The annual cost right now is about $56 billion. And the vast majority of that, about $50 billion, is related to direct medical costs and hospitalizations account for the vast majority of it. If we actually prescribe controllers and see patients, particularly children, as regular outpatients to make sure their disease is controlled, we actually can drive the cost down. Um, and the reason for that is that they're being controlled on their medications and with regular follow-up, they're not utilizing the emergency department and they're not being admitted. 
Um, about half the children with asthma miss at least one school day a year because of asthma, and it totals to about 13 million missed school days each year. Unfortunately, there's a subset of children who have very poorly controlled disease. Um, some of it's related to, um, you know, parents not wanting to give control or medicines or not fully understanding the disease and understanding that it can be controlled. And these kids, it really impacts upon their school attendance um, and then their learning and then again potentially their career opportunities in the future. When children miss school, adults also miss school. Um, obviously, they're not able to go to work. Between adults who have asthma and adults with children with asthma, um, about 30% of them miss um, work each year. And it costs about $2 billion in indirect costs related to wages. Um, so it's a financial burden both economically for the healthcare system, but it also can be an economic burden for families as well. There's a lot of disparities in asthma. Um, there's ethnic differences in asthma rates as well as severity and death rates. A lot of it we believe is related to poverty and it clusters in inner city areas. Um, in the inner city area, poor air quality has been shown to contribute to these asthma disparities. Also, um, indoor allergen exposure in the form of you know, cockroaches and rodents and even dust mite contributes. And then unfortunately, a lot of these children are also exposed to tobacco smoke in the homes. Um, you know, the prevalence of smoking has decreased somewhat over the last several decades, but it's still in Pennsylvania well over 20%. There's also a lot of um, issues with patient education and misinterpretation um, that contribute to these asthma disparities. It's very important to patients with asthma understand the disease and understand you know, that the doctor and the health care team wants to partner with them and their families to make their outcomes better. This takes time. It's not a five-minute in-and-out visit. It takes time to build trust. It takes a lot of time to educate the patients and make sure they understand the disease, make sure they understand what the medicines are for and why they're taking them. And many people will have fears about medicines, and they may not actually tell you the first time. Some of them are afraid the medicines will make the disease worse. Others are afraid they'll become addicted to them. Um, others confuse them with anabolic or bodybuilding steroids. Um, but you do have to just spend time educating over and over. Um, many of these patients, particularly these inner city children, are surrounded by excellent health care, but they still have trouble accessing it. In my particular geographic region in Pittsburgh, we actually have some challenges with public transportation. And a lot of patients aren't able to get to the doctor for their regular visits. So they end up going to urgent care or local emergency rooms acutely. So they really never get the education they need. There's a lot of work being done on looking at inner city living and just the psychological stress involved with it and exposure to violence. Um, there's a whole realm of research looking at this. Um, typically, these, many of these inner city children will live in violent areas and the moms are afraid to let them go outside. Um, so they're not outside exercising, you know, if there's indoor smokers or being exposed to the smoke. Um, there's a variety of studies looking at how stress actually can impact upon asthma as well. So that's the reason for many of these disparities. Um, there's several racial disparities. Rates of asthma and attacks are actually the highest in Puerto Ricans, and there's about 3 million United States Hispanics who have asthma. Um, overall, the African-American pediatric population has seen the greatest rise in the rate of asthma over the last several decades. Um, about one in six African-American children are actually diagnosed with asthma. That's alarming. That rate is more than double what we see in Caucasian children. And again, um, we made this point earlier, but the African Americans are three times more likely to be hospitalized and to also die from asthma. Um, so it's very important to keep these disparities in mind when you're dealing with patient population. Pediatrics also bears the brunt of the burden of asthma. About one out of 10 school children have asthma. And in pediatrics, asthma is the 30, third leading cause of hospitalization. 
And of all the children who have asthma, one in five, or about 20%, visit an emergency department each year. Now again, some of that is related to the fact that if they're in the inner city area, they may not be getting you know, the acute, the chronic care rather that they need, and they're using these acute facilities. Um, but those are very alarming numbers. Um, you know, if you have five children sitting in a room that have asthma, at least one of them has been to the ER in the past year. That's rather alarming. It's very well known that there are more boys with asthma in childhood than girls. Uh, no one understands exactly the reason for this. Interestingly, about middle age, it switches, and we see more women with asthma than men. Um, but your typical picture you know, of an asthmatic is a male child. Um, and that doesn't mean that females don't get it, but they do, but we do see traditionally many more boys with asthma than girls. This just reviews some of the common asthma symptoms. Asthma can be very frightening if anyone's ever watched an attack. And many times the patient, while they're experiencing an attack, it's very frightening, and then the fright actually worsens the symptoms. Um, most patients will present with coughing. Um, if they're having an outright attack, you may hear wheezing. It's important to remember that in an otherwise stable individual, you may not hear wheezing until they look, drop their lung function in half. And that's important because they may actually have complaints of shortness of breath or chest tightness or coughing, and you yet may not be able to hear, hear the wheezing. Um, just because you don't hear wheezing doesn't mean they're not having active asthma symptoms. Uh, many times, particularly with the younger children, they'll breathe very rapidly as well. Um, and it's very important to remember asthma symptoms can get out of control and lead to a medical emergency if they're not treated promptly. And we're going to go through the emergency treatment of it. Um, and we're also later on going to talk about how emotions, including fear you know, and anxiety, um, can exacerbate asthma. Um, I like to point out that many children um, can have mild persistent asthma, and it may not present um, with outright attacks they may actually present more with uh, manifestations of trouble exercising. These are the children who, when they're running and playing or coughing or they have to stop and catch their breath or they just can't keep up with the other kids. This is usually how we pick them up in our office if they're coming in for evaluation. Um, they have a history of just not being able to keep up the exercise tolerance with the other children. Severe attacks um, do occur you do need to seek immediate medical care for them. If there's any fast breathing with retractions, if there's cyanosis, if you see flaring, which is rapid movement of the, of the nostrils, and again, the retractions, the rib or the stomach moving in and out deeply, um, or if you have an expanded chest that doesn't deflate upon exhalation. The other sign, particularly in adolescent and older children, young adults, um, they can actually have a severe asthma attack and not be wheezing because it's so severe that they've trapped so much air in their lungs that their chest isn't moving so you can't hear the air move. So again, it's important to not be thrown off um, just because you don't hear wheezing. Um, if you see any of these signs, it's really a serious attack and it needs immediate medical treatment. There's a lot of biophysiologic changes during an asthma attack. I'm going to review them here, and the next slide will actually show a cartoon of them. Basically, asthma is an, a disease of inflammation or swelling of the airways. Um, airways basically become overreactive or hyperreactive, and then they are more sensitive to triggers. And there can be a variety of triggers, and we'll talk about these later on. Um, respiratory infections, you know, irritants like smoke, pollens, those type of things. What happens is the um, inflammation causes the linings of the airways to swell, and then they become, they become smaller. The other thing that happens is the inflammatory cells create lots of mucus, which also clogs the opening in the airways. And then finally, there's a lot of chemicals or mediators released during an allergy attack, an asthma attack, that actually cause bronchoconstriction of the breathing muscles um, that are around your airways. And those muscles tighten and, and basically clamp down, and it's very difficult to move air, um, you know, particularly out as well as in. And so once that happens, it's called airway obstruction. And again, it's due to a variety of things. The airways themselves actually swell. There's mucus clogging as well as that muscle tightening. 
This just shows a diagram of that pathophysiology. On top, you're looking at a cross-section of an airway of someone with mild asthma. And you'll see, um, you'll see a few changes between that and then someone with chronic severe asthma that actually has airway remodeling. Um, typically, in a healthy person or someone with mild asthma without airway remodeling or scarring, you'll actually see um, that the lining of the airway, if you go right into the center there, that first pink line, the um, cells lining the airway, the dark red is the open air space. But those cells are very uniform looking. They're not proliferating and they're not swollen. Um, and then you see just a slight amount of mucus. And we all make mucus to help clear you know, allergens and pathogens and irritants from both our upper and lower airway. Then you're also going to see right around the outside of that cross section, you see that band of muscle. That's the smooth muscle that can constrict during an attack. And you can see in either a control or someone with mild asthma that, that layer of muscle is relatively thin. Now you're going to contrast it with someone who's had chronic asthma and some, some long-term lung changes that we call airway remodeling or scarring. These patients show all three manifestations. Um, if you look at that cell structure in the pink um, inside there, you actually see how it's disarrayed and how large it is. That's because of the proliferation of the immune cells causing swelling. You also see lots of mucus, which is pretty much blocking the entire airway. And you see how thick that smooth muscle band is. Um, so with all three of those things, you barely have an opening to breathe through. And that's why many of these patients describe this as a sensation of breathing through a straw. A lot of patients experience worsening of asthma at night. It's very well recognized. And when I take a history, not only do I ask about exercise-induced symptoms, but I also ask if their symptoms worsen at night. Um, a lot of times, in most people at night, we actually have a natural drop in our hormone levels to protect us from inflammation. That would be typically cortisol. Our production decreases at about 4 a.m. It, it, it reaches its lull. So it's not unusual that these patients have worsening at night and they're often seeking emergency care at night. Um, this is very well recognized and, and it happens quite frequently in patients. Um, the important thing here is that patients can get on proper management with medications and an action plan and avoidance measures and they should be able to sleep through the night if we can control that inflammation. Now when you diagnose asthma, a lot really does go into it. Um, a very detailed medical history goes on, a physical examination, um, lung function testing helps in many of the older children and adults. We have some new technology I'm going to talk to you about that can actually measure airway inflammation or swelling. And then sometimes the doctor may order other things as well, a chest x-ray or allergy testing if they're worried about allergy triggers. It's important when we're diagnosing asthma to classify its severity. And we're going to go through how we do that, mild, moderate, and severe. And the reason for that is depending on severity, it actually drives where you start on the treatment plan. Um, so it's very important to know if they're mild, moderate, or severe as well as if they're intermittent or persistent. We'll walk through all of that. Diagnosis of asthma in preschoolers can be challenging. Um, I feel comfortable making a diagnosis in children less than one, given an appropriate history um, in the family as well as in the child and other associated conditions. Um, I'm a specialist and I do feel comfortable with that. A lot of times primary care doctors may not feel comfortable and some of them don't feel comfortable making the definitive diagnosis until the child's three to five years of age. Um, it, it can be a challenge. Um, we do know from studies conducted in Tucson, Arizona over two to three decades, they enrolled babies at birth and they actually followed them um, through adulthood. They're actually um, in their mid-20s right now. And they actually did allergy testing and breathing testing on about 2,000 of these babies um, every year. And what they found is about half the children who wheeze as preschoolers are only wheezing when they get a viral infection and they don't have persistent asthma. The other half actually have persistent asthma and they wheeze with respiratory viruses and they have lots of features of allergy and they wheeze with other triggers as well. 
Um, we actually have criteria that we can use to help pinpoint which group you're going to fall into. Um, and so I do use that, and it has about 85% sensitivity as well as specificity and predicting who's going to go on to have asthma and who's going to really just be a viral-induced wheezer. What we know happens in this 50% of the virus-induced wheezer, there are breathing tubes, just like we're all born at different you know, heights and weights and eye colors and hair colors. Their breathing um, tube sizes are just different. Some of them are a little bit smaller than, than others. And the children who tend to have smaller breathing tubes or air passages, anytime they get a cold, that causes some inflammation both in the upper as well as lower airways, and that's just enough to trigger them over the edge to weave. In contrast, children who are born with more medium or larger sized airways, um, if they get a cold, that inflammation from the cold does cause swelling in their upper and lower airways, but because their airways are smaller, it's not enough to make them weave so they don't manifest. And typically what happens is they catch up over time and outgrow by the time they're school-aged if they're virus-induced wheezing. It's very similar to what happens with children who have recurrent ear infections because of the placement and size of the eustachian tube. They pretty much outgrow it. Um, so diagnosing it in preschoolers can be challenging. Um, a lot of these kids aren't able to do breathing tests. Um, but I'm going to actually describe a procedure to you that is available for these preschoolers at some of the major medical centers. Um, many times we're left with just doing a trial of bronchodilator therapy in them to see if it improves their symptoms. Um, and if it, they do have acute improvement with bronchodilators like albuterol, then we will see how they do on control or medications as well. Um, but it can be a bit of a challenge, but typically by the time they're school age, five to six years of age, we can make a good firm diagnosis. There's a lot of components of the medical history that are important for a diagnosis. Um, we always want to focus on how severe the symptoms are and how often they're happening. Has the patient gone to the emergency room? Have they needed to be hospitalized? If so, were they in an intensive care unit or intubated? Um, we want to know if they're waking up at night. Is this interfering with their ability to go to school as well as to exercise? We also take a detailed history about what medications may have been tried in the past and whether they respond. Um, I like to take a lot of history about whether the child has any history of nasal allergies or food allergies or eczema. All these disorders tend to be inherited together. And we do know from that Tucson study I talked about earlier that children who do have documented allergy or eczema and wheezing are more likely to be in that asthmatic group instead of the um, viral-induced wheezing group. The other thing that's very important is family history. If there's any family history of atopic diseases like allergy, eczema, or asthma, it makes it more likely the child will have asthma. Um, you want to know what the exposures to different triggers are. Are there pets at home? Um, and not just dogs or cats, some people keep, you know, pet gerbils or rabbits, some children ride horses. You want to know if there's tobacco smoke exposure in the home. Um, you know, a more detailed history can actually, you know, elicit whether there's mold exposure as well. And then you always want to know what's triggering their problems. Um, viral respiratory infections trigger problems both in the viral induced wheezers, but also in the um, asthmatics it does. Exercise is often also a trigger. It's not unusual for a patient to come in and see me um, because they're not keeping up with their peers in activity. Uh, they can't run as hard or as fast or as long. And um, you know they're brought in to see if they have asthma, and that's what's contributing to it. Some of these kids will actually self-select. They'll just opt out of sports because they know they have a problem with it. Um, they, they grow up with the problem and don't recognize that it's there because they've lived with it every day, so they'll, they'll tend to stay on the bench more and not be as active. And that's definitely not what we want. Um, you know, I've had many children describe asthma to me um, in various ways, and one of the most memorable is, um, there's two of them actually that come to mind. One was a child who showed himself sitting on the sideline while everyone else was playing basketball because he couldn't play. And that's really not what we want. We should be able to control his symptoms so he can go out and play. The other one was the child who drew a picture where when he doesn't have asthma, it's like having a basketball that's totally inflated and can bounce. 
So when his asthma is acting up, the basketball's deflated and, and you can't play. Um, so at a very early age, these kids pick up on this. Um, they may not be able to verbalize it, and they may not totally recognize it as asthma, as a disease, but they know something's not right, and it usually shows up in their exercise. We can do a lot of lung function tests. Um, basically, we can do spirometry, and I'm going to show you a picture of that in a minute. Uh, we tend to do it both with and without a bronchodilator, such as albuterol. And this is looking at how much air a patient can blow out in the first second. Typically, patients with active asthma, that number will be reduced. Um, if you have intermittent disease or mild disease, it may be normal. Um, so it's important to not just focus on this number, but the, the medical history as well and how they respond to other medications. Um, and then after we give them the bronchodilator albuterol, we like to wait 10 to 15 minutes and then see if they have any reversibility. The hallmark finding in spirometry of asthma is a reversible obstruction. So you'll see their forced expiratory vital capacity, their forced expiratory capacity in one second. You'll see it being reduced from normal, but after albuterol, it will go up. Um, and that's routinely done you know, in many specialist offices, whether it's a pulmonologist or an allergist. And some primary care doctors do do this in their office. Another thing that can be handy is a peak flow meter. And we're going to talk about this later on when we talk about asthma action plans. But it also can be useful to help diagnose what's going on. Um, many times patients will have intermittent symptoms, and if we can demonstrate they're having drops with their peak flow, um, that'll help confirm a diagnosis. I also use the peak flow as a field test um, with exercise. Kids who um, are saying they only have symptoms with exercise, I may have them do a peak flow before ball practice, and then one when they have the sensation. And if it's dropping a certain percentage, it helps diagnose the disease. We can often do trigger tests if we're not sure what's going on. Um, these are called bronchoprovocations. Basically, we can challenge patients with exercise, cold air, or a chemical called methacholine. Patients who have asthma, these things will induce airway constriction, so they'll actually have an attack. We can do spirometry first. It's a, it's a mild attack because we're controlling how much we're giving them and the level of it. But we actually can do a breathing test with spirometry, see where they are baseline, apply the trigger, and then repeat spirometry. And typically, if it drops a certain percentage, then it confirms there is airway hyperreactivity and a diagnosis of asthma. One of the newer tests out there is called um, uh, Pheno, and it's fractional expiration of nitric oxide. It's a really neat test. Um, Spirometry is measuring how well the lungs are working, but it doesn't pick up swelling or inflammation. Um, this new test is a breath test also, and I have a picture to show you in a few slides, but it can actually in real time measure if there's active airway inflammation or swelling. It's a very clear-cut number. If you're above a certain number, you, you have asthma that's not controlled. If you're below a number, um, you either don't have asthma or if you've been on controller therapy, you're well controlled with it. Um, so it's a nice test and it's a nice addition to, um, you know, what we're able to do. Unfortunately, not all the insurances in our state are covering it yet. Some of them are, others aren't. Um, it's actually been out for about seven or eight years, FDA approved, and it's very inexpensive. It's only about $15 per test, but some of the insurances just haven't picked it up. But it does sometimes help us in difficult situations figure out what's going on. This first slide here is showing you spirometry. Um, this is all incentive-based. The patient has to want to cooperate. Um, I do a lot of research studies, and sometimes we can get children as young as two to three years of age to do this. They often won't do it the first visit. Um, we often have to work with them over time, but we can eventually get them to do it. What they have to be able to do is take a deep breath in, and they blow out as hard and as fast and as long as they can. And it sounds easy, but when you're doing it, it can get pretty hard, particularly if you have asthma, because that deep breath can sometimes even trigger an attack. Um, so it's very much technician and patient dependent. 
Um, you have to have a child who's old enough to do it as well as cooperative, and you have to have a technician who can, who can coax the patient through. When my staff is doing this test, I can hear them down the hallway saying, blow, 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 blow harder, blow longer, you know, and, and basically you want to get a good result from this. Um, it again, if there's evidence of persistent asthma on there or um, an exacerbation, it helps confirm the diagnosis and also helps you guide um, your treatment options by telling you how severe they are. Again, if somebody comes in to see me as a routine outpatient visit, and their spirometry is normal, it still doesn't rule out asthma. Uh, but if it is abnormal that day and consistent with asthma, it helps confirm it. So we like to do this both before and after um, albuterol bronchodilator. The other thing to keep in mind is a lot of children, if they're in sports and they, they actually have very good lung function to begin with, just because they blow the first time before the medicine and it appears to be in the normal range, I still give the bronchodilator because they, some of them may have lung function is 120% of what we predict or 130%. So it's still important to try to reverse them if they start at normal. This next slide shows a young man with a peak flow meter. I don't recommend peak flow meters for everyone, but it's very helpful in gauging what's going on if the patient's not able to articulate to the parents what's going on. Or sometimes the parents aren't sure if the child's coughing because they're having post-nasal drip from allergies or a cold, or is it asthma, or is it something else. Um, these are inexpensive handheld devices, and what the child does is they blow out into them as hard and as fast as they can, and it gives us the measurement. And we can um, record it for a period of weeks to see what their personal best is. And then if they start to drop below a certain percentage of their personal best, that's when we say they're having an attack. So we can actually use it to help guide an asthma action plan. Um, I have some families that are very much dependent on this, um, and it really helps them know what to do. I think in the school setting it's very helpful because it's hard for the nurses to know everything about every single patient with asthma. Um, so if they could have a peak flow meter and, and they come in and you're short, not sure what's going on, it is helpful. Um, so many of the asthma action plans that are available out there actually do have a place on them for us, the physician, to fill out what's their peak flow meter, personal best, and when do you want to give albuterol, and when do we need to think about a controller or um, an oral steroid, or when do they need to go to the emergency room. Um, so it's a very inexpensive device, and it does work for many patients. Um, you know, I have adults who have mild intermittent disease. They don't typically go around doing peak flow meters. And I don't really have the children do them every day. Um, once I collect their baseline information and can formulate what their best is and what the cutoffs are for different treatments for the action plan, I really only have them use it as needed. And again, the other place I like to use it is if I'm uncertain of the diagnosis. Um, you know, I talked a bit earlier about a lot of children don't exercise because they have asthma. And then we also see a lot of children who come in and they're not exercising just because they're out of shape and someone's concerned is it asthma. And some of them are just not physically fit because they're couch potatoes. Um, they're playing video games and not getting outdoors and being active. So a good way to help sort out what is going on is to actually know what their peak flow value is and then when they're exercising, um, repeat it. And if it doesn't drop, that really rules out you know, it being asthma. Um, so it can be useful for a physician for diagnosis, but it's certainly useful for families as well as physicians and school nurses for assessing what's going on during an acute attack. This is the um, exhaled nitric oxide machine. Um, it's called a NIOX or a pheno machine. Um, this is a young little fellow here. Um, it's, it's shaped about the size of a football, and um, there's a little mouthpiece that he breathes into. And the key to this is they have to breathe out at a fixed rate. Um, so it actually will show them a picture, either lights will change color, or here he's blowing up the balloon up in the sky. And you have to keep it at a certain rate, and it's also um, give them a sound incentive too, so they know where in the, when they're in that range. And then they exhale for several seconds at that fixed rate, and what we measure is how much nitric oxide their airways are producing. Nitric oxide is an inflammatory mediator that's always made in our airways. And if you have asthma or uncontrolled asthma that's not being treated with medicines, 
it can be elevated. I'm an adult, if the number is greater than 20, we're worried about asthma, and children, if it's greater than 30 or 35, we're worried about asthma. Um, so it's a very useful test to, to do. In general, I find it easier to get the younger children to do this um, versus the spirometry. Um, again, the um, unfortunate aspect of it is that we don't all have it available clinically because some of the insurances aren't covering it. Hopefully, as it's been out longer, they will pick it up. Um, again, it's relatively inexpensive. It's, it's a nice tool to have. The other thing about these tools are that they're visual. You can actually print out the result. The parents can watch this airway inflammation number come up. They can watch the results of the spirometry, and you can actually show them that there is a problem. Um, it helps give you objective evidence to support your diagnosis. This is a neat tool. It's called impulse oscillometry. And um, this can be used in preschoolers to do airway function measurements. A lot of the preschoolers can't do spirometry unless you spend a lot of time with them over repeated sessions. So if I, as a physician, am clinically seeing someone that's a preschooler um, and they're not going to be able to do spirometry and they're not in a study and I'm not going to see them back every couple weeks for a long time, it's going to be hard to teach them that. Impulse oscillometry, um, basically what it is is this radar for your lungs. They basically, um, you breathe into this machine, the child breathes normally. They don't have to take deep breaths in or out. They don't have to blow as hard or as fast as they can. They do tidal breathing, normal breathing in and out. And as they're breathing in and out, the machine is producing a sound wave that shoots down into their airways. And based on how it bounces back, it tells us if there's obstruction down there. And um, there's clear-cut criteria that help us decide if a child has obstructive disease consistent with asthma. Um, it's a little bit expensive. You know, it costs probably about $30,000 to buy this equipment. So you only see this um, in major medical centers. Um, this isn't something you'll see in your doctor's office or a local allergist or pulmonologist office. You'll probably see it only in pediatric institutions. Um, but it can be helpful if you're not sure what's going on. Um, again, we take the history, how often are they having symptoms, we take their breathing test numbers, and we want to assign different severities of asthma to them as well as different um, classifications. So the mildest form of asthma is intermittent asthma. These are patients who have symptoms less than twice a week, and they don't wake up more, they wake up less than twice, um, twice during the night throughout the month. Um, these are patients who often go six, maybe sometimes 12 months without any problems. They may be exposed to a trigger and then have an attack. They're called mild intermittent. Um, basically, they don't go on control or therapy because they're not having persistent symptoms. These are your patients that just use albuterol as needed. Uh, your next severity is mild persistent. These are patients who are having symptoms at least twice a day, uh, tw two days a week and waking up about three or four times a month. Sometimes when I see these patients, they may have some mild reductions in their spirometry. Sometimes they may not. Um, these kids basically are having enough symptoms that albuterol rescue alone is not enough for them. The fact that they're having symptoms at least twice a week and waking up three or four times you know, a month indicates they have inflammation and persistent disease, and they do need to go on a controller. Then the next category is moderate persistent. These are those kids and adults who basically wheeze every day or have shortness of breath every day, and they're waking up at least once a week. Typically, they do have decreases in their lung function testing, their spirometry when we see them, and they also have a decreased peak flow rating. Patients with severe persistent asthma, they basically have symptoms all day long, and they wake up almost every night. Um, fortunately, most patients, about half patients, have intermittent disease, so they're just going to be on albuterol as needed. Um, of the other 50 percent, probably about 20 to 30, probably about 20 to 30 percent of those are mild persistent, some moderate persistent, and only 5 to 10 percent severe persistent. Um, the important thing to remember here is that they have intermittent disease or symptoms less than twice a week. They're intermittent, albuterol only. Once you reach that threshold of two times a week having symptoms or albuterol use, you really do need to be on a daily controller medication. 
And then the doctor, when they evaluate the patient, if they're mild, moderate, or severe, that's going to de determine their treatment decisions, what their controllers will be. There's a lot of different asthma treatments. Again, we can't cure asthma, but we can definitely control it. Um, and again, that type and severity actually drive the treatment decision. Once you have any severity of persistent asthma, mild, moderate, or severe, the patient should be on a controller therapy. Um, and then the other important component of treatment is an individualized action plan. Um, it should list what their triggers are, as well as medication instructions for daily use, as well as emergency use. And we're going to walk through this over um, the next few slides. One of the things I do want to spend some time on is talking about asthma medications. Uh, many of them are delivered by inhalation. Um, we have a variety of inhalers out there now. Some of them are meter dose inhalers. Um, others are dry powder inhalers. And we still do use nebulizers in a lot of the preschoolers or if someone's having a severe attack. We actually have oral tablets out there. The most popular one right now is Monte Lucast. Um, it blocks leukotrines, and a lot of patients are on that because it's a once-a-day tablet. Xyluton is a sister medicine of Monte Lucast, and the only difference is it's dosed twice a day, so you don't see it used as much. Um, we don't see a lot of patients on theophylline because of the adverse effects of it, and then we do have better treatments now, but occasionally you will meet someone on theophylline. I couldn't tell you the last time I saw a child on it, but occasionally I'll meet an adult that's on it. Um, one of the neat things in our field is we actually, for the severe asthmatics, have new medications that have come out, and we'll spend some time walking through these. These are basically monoclonal antibodies um, that bind up out different allergy chemicals. In one case, they bind up the IgE molecule uh, that causes the reaction, you know, allergic reactions, and then the other case that binds up a cytokine or chemical that's associated with allergy and asthma. These are shots that are given every two to four weeks, depending on the medicine and then how allergic the patient is, and are approved for moderate to severe asthma that's not responding to other treatments. Um, so you sometimes will see children on these medications. Um, it's really helped fill a niche for these patients with severe disease. Again, most patients have more mild or moderate disease, but for the ones who have severe disease, if we're not able to control them on the inhalers, this has really changed their life. Um, it's very important to remember that for inhalers to work right, they have to be used correctly. There have been numerous studies done that show not only patients, but even healthcare professionals often use inhalers incorrectly. Um, and it used to be just as easy as saying, you know, shake it, prime it, spray it, hold your breath. But all these devices are changing now. Uh, we actually have albuterol out there now in a um, self-activated inhaler where when the patient breathes in, it comes in. The dry powder inhalers are different um, than the meter dose inhalers. So it's very important that the patient get instructions on how to use the meds. And then often when I first see them and start them on medicines, I'll bring them in back in two weeks to make sure you're, they're using them correctly. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to educate pharmacists on how to you know, correctly teach patients to use meds as well. Um, about half the patients don't use these inhalers correctly, and if they're not getting the medication where it needs to go, it's not going to work. Um, so we always ask patients to show us their technique when they're in here with us. Um, if they're having a lot of trouble using a, a meter dose inhaler, we'll think about a spacer, or in the case I just mentioned, that breath-activated inhaler can be useful too. Nebulizers are useful. Um, they're machines that have tubing that turns the liquid medicine into a mist that's then inhaled. Um, we do see a lot of um, you know, toddlers and preschoolers on nebulized um, controller medication as well as rescue medication, um, and it does work for them. It does take longer to give a nebulizer than it does a meter dose inhaler, um, but if they're not be being able to use the meter dose inhaler because they're too young, this is a good option. It is important to remember if they are using a nebulizer, you want closed delivery. So that means they either have a face mask on and are breathing the medicine through the face mask or they're breathing it through a mouthpiece. Giving it by blow-by is very ineffective, um, and they really don't get that much medicine delivered that way. Um, so it's important that if they are on a nebulizer or if you're using one in your office, that you do use a face mask with it or a mouthpiece. 
Now, there's a lot of different asthma medications out there. Um, we're going to talk about long-term controllers as well as quick-release medications. Basically, your long-term controllers help prevent and control asthma symptoms, and you have to take them regularly for best results. And this is the biggest hurdle I see in treatment. Um, patients will start to feel better, and then they'll quit taking it. Or the first dose will run out, and they feel great, so they won't refill it. Or they might be afraid this long-term controller will make their asthma worse eventually, or they might be addicted to it, or they confuse it with bodybuilding steroids. So there's, this is where education comes in, time over and over and over again each time they come in. Um, quick relief medicine, they relieve the asthma symptoms when they're happening. They typically act fast to relieve um, the bronchospasm or relax those tight muscles so that the air can flow again. And again, if they're using it more than twice a week, um, we want to know because that means they're not controlled and that if they're not on a controller, we should start one. Or if they are on a controller, it's not adequate enough. So we have to assess whether they're using it right. And if they are using it right, then we have to assess whether they need additional medication. So first, I'm going to spend some time talking about the long-term controllers. The most common one we prescribe are inhaled steroids. Um, these actually fight inflammation or swelling, and they're proven to be the best medications that we have. They're actually available in once or twice a day dosing, so it does make it convenient for the patients. We also have other medicines that are called long-acting beta agonists, and uh, if you have more moderate or severe disease, this actually can be given twice a day to help keep the airways open. Um, and some of the newer medications, it can be given just once a day. Um, most of the patients who are on a long-acting beta agonist are actually on a combination product that has that inhaled steroid in plus that long-acting beta agonist. So the patient is using one device but getting two medicines out of it. Um, there's also oral leukotriene modifiers. These are things like Singular or Monte Lucas that I mentioned early. They're very nice for patients with mild asthma, and they're also approved for allergic rhinitis. And a lot of children who have asthma also have allergies. Um, so this can often be useful in those patients. Again, theophylline is a long-term controller. We don't tend to see it a lot in our area, but it is out there, and occasionally someone is on it. Um, oral steroids are only used in severe asthmatics. Um, I have not seen a child on oral, persistent oral steroids for long-term control for probably 15 years. Occasionally, I'll see an adult. And that's really because we have better medicines now. We have these combination products. We have these leukotriene modifiers. And for the severest ones that would get stuff on oral steroids, we actually have these injectable biologic modifiers now. Um, they've really changed these patients' lives around. Um, the first one that came out about seven or eight years ago is called omalizumab. And basically, when you have allergy, um, and it's triggering asthma, it's called allergy-induced asthma. Um, you're making IgE antibodies, which we'll talk about later on in the talk, um, to things that you're allergic to. What this shot does is it's administered every two to four weeks, depending on the patient's body weight and what their allergy or IgE level is. What it does is it's administered subcutaneously every two or four weeks, and it's absorbed into your system and binds up all the circulating allergy protein called IgE, so these patients don't have allergic and asthmatic reactions. One of the newer ones that came out is called mepolizumab. This came out shortly before Christmas. And it, it also is a shot, and you give it once a month, and it blocks one of the chemicals or cytokines that's involved in allergy and asthma reactions that's called IL-5. Um, so both these medicines are now available for patients who have severe asthma. Um, if they failed everything else, they're candidates for this. And I've actually seen it seen them remarkably change the lifestyles of severe asthmatics so that they're able to actually live normal lives, sleep at night, um, exercise, play, go to school. Um, quick relief medication, most of us are familiar with albuterol, which is a short-acting beta agonist. It works within minutes to relieve the symptoms. If someone's having an acute attack, this is what you want to give them. It works by relaxing those smooth muscles around the airways. We also have anticholinergic um, that are available. They act a bit slower than beta agonists. They take about a half hour um, to have an effect. 
Um, we will sometimes have patients using this, but most asthmatic, particularly children, are using the albuterol. This also works by relaxing smooth muscles around the airways, but it works on the nerves instead of the airways directly, and that's why it takes longer. And it also can decrease mucus production. Sometimes if patients go to the emergency room or if they have severe disease, they'll actually be on a combination product that has both these medicines in it. Um, typically, we don't see a lot of outpatients on that combination medicine, particularly pediatrics, but occasionally you will. You would know it as a duo NIP, um, you know, something like that. It would have um, atrovenin as well as the albuterol. Now, this is asthma triggers. This is very important. If you go back to what we do when we educate and treat asthma, the first thing you want to do is try to identify their triggers and teach them to avoid them. Uh, again, in pediatrics, uh, most of the patients with asthma have allergies. It's not the same in adults. The adults seem to have more multifactorial asthma, but it's very rare to see a child with asthma who's not triggered by allergies. Uh, tobacco smoke is a big trigger air pollution, particularly in inner city areas, respiratory infections. I spent a bit of time earlier talking about viral induced wheezing versus persistent asthma. You know, if you have viral induced wheezing, your only trigger is a respiratory infection. But if you have persistent asthma, um, respiratory infections are a trigger of it as well as these other, other triggers. Exercise can trigger it, and I want to spend a few minutes talking about that in a minute. Weather changes can trigger it. Um, when we have sudden decreases in temperatures where we're having more than 30, 40 degree temperature changes, uh, that triggers it, sometimes humidity, and that's because it's trapping ozone and pollutants in the air. Um, that can trigger it as well, and strong emotions. Um, sometimes patients will tell you when they laugh they have an asthma attack or when they cry. Um, and this is one of the things that goes on whenever a child's having an attack. If they're panicking, it's going to make the attack worse. If you want to teach them to breathe and, and try to relax and remain calm. It's, it's easier said than done, but that emotion can drive it. Um, I do want to say one thing about exercise. We do have a subset of patients that have purely exercise-induced asthma. These are typically patients that when they're running vigorously, and they're typically manifest in competitive athletes. Um, they really don't have any evidence of persistent asthma that needs a daily controller. Um, they're only using albuterol with exercise. What's happening in them is that they're moving the air in and out of their airways so rapidly that it's cooling the airways, and then that's causing bronchoconstriction. So it is possible to have pure exercise-induced asthma without having evidence of persistent asthma and needing a daily controller. And the kids with the exercise-induced asthma, we're very comfortable just having them pre-treat with albuterol before exercise. We don't count that as a strike against them. Um, you know, if we find that they're using it at other times, though, then with exercise is making us more concerned about persistent disease. The other thing is that Monte Lucas, that tablet that I talked about earlier, the blocks leukotrines and is approved for asthma, it does have an FDA-approved indication for exercise-induced asthma. So in many of the patients that are real active, um, you know, if they're participating in sports several times a day, it may make sense to consider that as a, a you know, a treatment for their exercise-induced asthma in addition to albuterol. So again, our goals of asthma treatment, we want to raise the bar on this. People think that if you have asthma, you shouldn't be active. You should be sitting on the sideline. They think you should be sick and going to the doctors. And that's wrong. We have doctors that can treat patients, and we have excellent medications that should control symptoms. Our goals are to have the patient be active without any asthma symptoms. I tell my patients, I am not doing my job if they have to go to the ER to see their doctor because they're sick. I want to see them you know, routinely to keep them well, and I want them to take their controllers to keep them well. But if they need to go to the ER, we failed. Um, they should be able to fully take part in exercise and sports. It's rare to have a patient with severe asthma that can't. Um, almost every child with asthma should be able to fully take part in exercise and sports. It's not normal to hold them out um, of sports. If we're controlling them, they should be out there exercising. We want them to sleep all night without ex episodes. We want them to go to school and work regularly. Um, we aim to have very good lung function testing in them. Um, the other thing we want to do is minimize any side effects from medicines. 
Um, and these inhaled steroids we tend to prescribe, um, they are relatively safe. Decades ago, before they had them, patients with asthma were treated with oral steroids, and you could have all kinds of adverse side effects from taking them for long periods of time. The whole purpose of making the inhaled steroids is to deliver a very small dose locally. Now, you may, you may occasionally see someone who gets hoarseness or thrush with it, um, and you want to use mouth rinsing or toothbrushing afterwards, as well as a spacer if that's happening. Um, but we really don't see any of these anabolic steroid effects. There's no big muscles being bulked up. The kids aren't going to get addicted to the medicine, and the medicine's not going to make their asthma worse. But these are things you have to spend time talking to the family about. Um, and really, my goal is that these patients should not use the emergency room, and they should not be having acute visits. I'm not doing my job if that happens. So I always tell them when they're leaving my office that they're going to make me look bad if they end up in the emergency room. Um, everyone should have an asthma action plan. There's really no excuse not to. They're readily available everywhere. Many of the school children, they come in, their nurses sent one in for me to fill out. They're available on different websites. Um, this is just an example of what they look like. Uh, the asthma action plan is individualized for the patient. Um, it's actually going to talk about um, what their triggers are and what, what to do if certain symptoms are, are happening or if they're dropping their peak flow. Um, typically, we divide it into different zones. The green zones mean that your lung function or your peak flow is 80% or better than we predict it to be. Um, you're not having symptoms, and you're just going to take your daily controllers if, there, if you have any. The yellow zone is when you start to fall down, um, you know, below the 80 percent, and that means you're going into an attack, and it's going to instruct you to start to use rescue medicine, and then, you know, depending on how, whether you're going back up to the green zone or how long this is lasting, and they also tell you to increase your daily controller meds or to start oral prednisone first. And then once you're in a red zone, that's very poor um, lung function. Often your peak flow is cut in half or you're having severe asthma symptoms. Typically, we have them take a loading dose of prednisone, give them albuterol, and have them call 911 or get to the ER because they need to be seen emergently. Um, and this is very helpful. I've had some families that come in and they're very confused. They don't know what they're supposed to do when. If you write this down, they're able to follow it. Now, I have to be honest, not everyone's going to stick with following the peak flow. Some of them are very good at it. If the child's sick, they'll do the peak flow. Others aren't. But at least it tells them what they're supposed to be taking when they're well. And then if they start to develop symptoms, what to do? And when do I need to go to the emergency room? So that's all very important. They actually learn a lot about their disease by walking through this with us a few times. Um, and then the other thing is they feel more empowered. They feel like they have control. Uh, they know what's going on. And instead of having to run to the ER or run into the doctor's office, they can actually evaluate the process that's happening and intervene so it's not so disruptive in their lifestyle. Um, so most of them actually feel very empowered when they have this, and they do pretty well with it. All right, again, this slide summarizes the different components of the asthma action plan that we just reviewed in detail. Um, you want to know what the triggers are and then minimize contact. You want to take asthma medications as prescribed regularly. And then you want to be able to track asthma signs and symptoms and recognize when it's worsening. And the final thing is the plan will actually tell you what to do if your asthma is worsening. So it's very important. Um, how do you identify triggers? Um, this is where part of the medical history comes in and perhaps allergy testing um, if the patient appears to have allergy triggers. Um, you know, pay attention to what's going on. A lot of times patients who have dust mite allergies are going to have symptoms if they're making a bed um, or if they're vacuuming. If they have pets or near animals or tobacco smoke, they may have a problem. Other triggers are respiratory infections, again, running, playing, or exercising. And then those strong emotions can sometimes trigger patients as well if they're upset, excited, or even tired. It's important to remember to take the medications that's prescribed. Um, if you have asthma, you want to make sure the doctor or nurse is regularly reviewing your technique at visits, particularly if you're not doing well. Um, and then if you're having trouble using some of these inhalers, we can think about spacers or those breath-actuated inhalers. 
it's very important to patients understand the difference between controller and rescue meds and when to use each one. And they always, always get confused. We've tried to do all kinds of things, even putting red labels on and green labels on for rescue and controller meds, and they still get confused, and that's why I like to bring them back a few weeks after diagnosis or starting a new med. And that's also why I like to give an action plan, because it's going to write right out on there what meds to control or what's to rescue, and when do you use each. Um, you really want to be open-ended if they have side effect concerns. You want them to feel comfortable talking to you about it. Um, they may not discuss it the first time or two, but eventually they will. Again, you want to track your asthma with that action plan with or without a peak flow meter. And the best scenario possible, we want a peak flow meter, but sometimes they won't use one. Again, it tells you what medicines to take, how much of it to use, when do you take it, when do you need to call your doctor, and when do you need to get to the emergency room. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now. We're going to talk about allergic rhinitis and conjunctivitis. Um, about 80% of children who have asthma do have underlying allergic rhinitis with or without conjunctivitis. And so it's very important to talk about both of these together. Um, allergic rhinitis is basically inflammation of the nose, and conjunctivitis is inflammation of the eyes, and it's caused by exposure to allergens. Typically what you'll see in the school setting is whenever the trees are blooming or when school is starting in the fall and the ragweeds out there blooming, these kids are going to come in. Uh, looking a mess with runny nose, swollen, watery eyes. Um, so most of them that you're going to see in the school setting are going to be your seasonal allergic rhinitis ones, and they're reacting to either those pollens or the mold. But you can also have year-round allergies, which are called perennial, and they're reacting to things they encounter every day. These could be dust mites, pets, cockroaches, or even rodents, um, depending on their setting. Um, and it's it's also possible that you can have a patient who has perennial year-round allergies, but they have seasonal flares because they're allergic to those things as well. Um, but by far, what you see in the school setting is really the season or seasonal exacerbations with the pollen. Um, again, an allergy is an immune system reaction to something foreign. In most cases, it's the pollen that's being inhaled. Most people, their immune system says, oh, that's not going to hurt me. I'm not going to bother it. It knows with allergy, their immune system is programmed to recognize it as not belonging and then mounting the response against it, which is inflammation. Um, allergies can be managed with um, prevention as well as treatment. And unlike asthma, we actually can potentially cure allergic rhinitis, and that's with immunotherapy. Um, that's the allergy shots, and now we have other forms of immunotherapy that you take daily under the tongue, and we'll talk about that. Um, allergy is really a very commonly overlooked disease. Many people have it. Um, probably about a third of the population has some form of allergic rhinitis. But people minimize it. No one dies of allergic rhinitis by itself. Um, but if you have it, you know you're miserable. Your eyes are itchy, watery red. Your nose is swollen. You can't breathe. You can't sleep. You're just miserable. Um, so it's often just minimized. Um, allergic rhinitis is very prevalent. About 50 million people in the U.S. have it. Again, just like we saw asthma is increasing, this is also increasing over time. It affects about 30% of adults and, believe it or not, about 40% of children. Um, allergic diseases are a common cause of chronic disease in patients. And, you know, many patients who have allergic disease do have asthma, particularly children. Um, so you'll see us commonly, if they have an asthma diagnosis, looking to see if they have allergies. Um, again, no one's going to die of allergic rhinitis by itself, but it does significantly impact on morbidity. Um, people are miserable. They can't pay attention at school or work. They're missing. They're having absences. Uh, they're not sleeping well at night. And even though allergic rhinitis itself, um, you know, isn't, I don't want to not say serious. It's not going to be life-threatening. It actually is associated with some other serious conditions. Obviously, if you have allergic rhinitis and asthma, allergies can trigger your asthma. Um, so that's very, very serious. Ear infections are often related to an allergic predisposition. So is sinusitis. Um, so it does have a further impact than just a nose. And again, just like asthma, we see it accounts for a lot of health care costs, about $18 billion annually. And there's about 16 million annual doctor visits for allergies each year. Symptoms are classic, itching in the nose and eyes, sneezing, 
the most common symptom that bothers people the most is the stuffy nose or the congestion. Of all these things, that's usually what they're saying is the worst of them. Uh, runny nose is also present, and then they'll often have post-nasal drip and sometimes cough. Um, allergic conjunctivitis, um, eye redness, itching. They'll often have a burning feeling, watery eyes. They can have swollen lids, and a lot of them will complain of a gritty sensation. Um, many patients will have the rhinitis without the conjunctivitis, but some will have both. It's very rare to see someone with just the conjunctivitis without the nasal symptoms. One of the things that I'm commonly asked is how do you tell if it's a cold or if it's allergies? Allergies, their hallmark here is the itchiness. The eyes are itchy, the nose is itchy, and the throat's itchy. Allergies always have a clear, watery nasal discharge. Patients who have common colds, it typically starts with a mild sore throat. You typically don't have that sensation with allergies. The other thing is when you get a cold, you usually start with a clear watery discharge and then it'll turn mucousy or whitish and thicker for a few days and then go back to clear. So those are ways I can tell on history what I think it is. Um, this got, goes through the pathogenesis of allergic rhinitis. Um, basically, patients who have allergy, they have um, antigen-presenting cells, which are dendritic cells or mast cells in their nasal passages or in their eye, you know, epithelium. And what happens is when the pollen allergen or whatever they're allergic to, if it's cat hair or dog hair or dust mite, when that comes into contact with the mucosa, these immune-presenting cells gobble up that allergen and process it and then present it to mast cells and basophils. And then those cells actually um, can release a variety of chemicals that cause the allergic reaction. They release things like histamine, um, leukotrines, and they also release cytokines. Um, so there's different layers of inflammation there. Um, the way we treat allergic rhinitis is we can give antihistamines to block histamine, anti-leukotrines to block leukotrines, and then nasal steroids to block those cytokines. Um, but again, the key here is that you're overreacting and making an IgE antibody to an allergen, which is you know, a pollen or, or one of the perennial allergens. And it causes this whole inflammatory and swelling cascade. How do we diagnose it? Again, it's very similar to asthma, a medical history. An exam is very useful. Um, allergy testing, either by skin or blood testing, can be done as well. This is exam. Um, we're looking at a, a child. She has allergic shiners, dark circles under her eyes. And if you look real closely, you can see several folds under her eyes, too. Those are called Denny's lines. Uh, patients who have allergies often come in looking like this. The other thing you usually see is that they'll be mouth breathing, and then many of them will have what we call an allergic salute or a nasal crease. And that's from taking their palm of their hand and rubbing the nose up because it's itchy all the time. You'll see a crease right across their nose. When I take the scope and look into their nose, what I see is their turbinates are inflamed and swollen. They typically look pale or bluish. They're normally supposed to be pink. If it's infection, they typically look red. You'll usually see watery secretions as well. But you'll see that total nasal obstruction when you look up in there. Um, allergy testing, it can be done in a skin testing or blood testing. Allergy testing is much gentler now than it used to be several decades ago. Um, most allergists will only do the puncture skin testing because we get a lot of false positives if we start doing intradermal or under skin testing. Um, the devices now are very small and portable, and they're really not painful. We do sometimes see children that are a little bit apprehensive, so we'll show them the device there. Um, basically, you just touch it into the extract and then touch their skin with it. Um, and it gives some microscopic punctures that really the patient doesn't feel. The most uncomfortable part is that if they have a positive reaction, it's going to be like a mosquito bite for a few minutes. They'll have that wheel and flare. And so they'll be a little bit uncomfortable from itching, but there really isn't pain involved. Um, the right side is actually showing you some positive skin test results. Histamine is a chemical we all make in our, in our blood and throughout our body. And sometimes patients will forget and they'll take an antihistamine before they get skin tested. And if they did that, our test won't work. Um, so that's why we test them with histamine and then we get that nice little bump there and the redness. So this patient actually has some allergies. Um, 
you know, that are showing up. You'll see bumps there um, alongside the histamine. Those are things they're reacting to. Along the upper part of the arm, you see that all those ones were negative. There's no bump there, and there's no redness. There's no will or flare. And allergy skin testing is nice because I can do it in the office and know what they're allergic to and teach them how to avoid it then. But it also shows them what the inflammation or swelling looks like. So exactly what's going on in the skin is what goes on in their eyes and nose if they're having those symptoms. So it's a good teaching tool. Um, blood testing is very fine. Um, the tests that we have now are, are very good and they're very specific and sensitive. It does cost a little bit more to do blood testing, but sometimes if the patient's on an antihistamine or if they have bad skin rashes and we can't skin test them, we will go ahead and do the blood test. Um, so that, that is a, a good route to go as well. Uh, you treat it a lot like you do asthma. Um, you want to avoid the triggers and then we have medication. And then I'm going to wind up by talking about allergy immunotherapy, um, which is really a curative um, treatment for allergies. So how do you avoid the triggers? Um, you know, you get skin tested or blood tested, and you identify what's causing them. Um, dust mites are little organisms that grow in bedding and upholstery. It doesn't mean the house is dirty or dusty. We have them everywhere. There's bedding or upholstery. Um, what you want to do is focus on your bedroom. I do not make these families go out and rip all the carpeting out and everything else to begin with because that's expensive. Um, they spend about, everyone spends about a third of their time right in their bed. So if we can work on that bed, it's going to help. You want to allergy proof um, the mattresses as well as the pillows, and that's both the box spring and the upper mattress. Um, these do not have to be expensive. They're available at places like Walmart and Target. That gives you a physical barrier between dust mites and the patient. The bedding needs to be washed in hot water every week. Um, this sounds easy, but it's very hard for people to do. Um, and then you want to keep the humidity less than 50% because dust mites thrive in heat and humidity. If they're allergic to pollens, you want to keep windows closed in the house and in the car. You never want to hang clothes out to dry because it's going to collect pollens on them. I actually tell the patients to take a shower each night and wash their hair. They may not see it, but there can be pollen on them, and then they'll be laying in their pillow, and it's in their hair, then it's on their face, and it's going to cause symptoms. A lot of the kids who are out there playing baseball at the time of the year when the tree pollen is out there, um, if they're having a lot of eye symptoms, I actually do recommend they put sports goggles on because it'll be a, a physical barrier. And a lot of the kids think they're cool, so you know, that's helping them along, along the way and they're looking cool. Um, it's, it's hard to avoid outdoor allergy triggers. Um, you just can do, you do the best you can. Um, molds can be indoor or outdoor. For the indoor molds, you want to um, treat any visible mold. If there's any leaks in plumbing or in the roofing, you want to have that repaired and use a dehumidifier. Um, it's hard to avoid molds outside. Um, they tend to flare up any time the ground's not frozen typically spring and fall. You know, if someone does have mold allergy, you don't want them out there in the fall jumping in leaves and, you know, raking leaves. That's going to be a problem for them. Um, pets, I want to make the point that there's no such thing as a hypoallergenic pet. Um, there's patients that do believe certain dogs or breeds that don't um, have our, you know, don't have allergenic components, but that's just not true. Um, they all do to some degree. If you do have a pet allergy, the best thing to have is a small dog because if you can bathe the animal every two weeks, studies have shown that you can get rid of the allergen enough that it's not going to cause your symptoms. Um, so that's really what I recommend if they, they have to have a pet. Unfortunately, most people come to you and they already have the pet. Um, I, I really don't see a lot of patients getting rid of their pets. Um, cats, cats are really um, problematic. When you're allergic to dogs, you're allergic to um, their epithelium, which is their skin that's shedding off. Um, and cats, what you're allergic to is a component of their saliva. I'm sorry, a component of their saliva. And that's very sticky. So even if you're washing walls and furniture and scrubbing rubs, it's still sticking. It's hard to get rid of that. Um, again, people don't like to get rid of pets, so they'll usually end up on medicines or immunotherapy. Um, but if they do have pets, you want to keep them out of the bedroom. If possible, bathe them every two weeks, and then consider HEPA filters. Those often help as well. The medications that we have, um, again, histamine is a key mediator in allergies, so a lot of patients will be on antihistamines. We have over-the-counter as well as prescription 
by mouth oral antihistamines that are taken once a day. We also have some nasal spray antihistamines that you can use as needed. They're by prescription, um, but there are some that are generically available by prescription. And you can use them twice a day just as needed. So if you're having a symptom, you use it. If you're not, you don't. And they actually have an onset of action within minutes. Um, patients who complain predominantly of post-nasal drip or rhinorrhea, we actually treat them with anticholinergic nasal sprays two to three times a day. Um, just like we use inhaled steroids for the airways of asthmatics, we can use nasal steroids for the nose of patients with allergic rhinitis. There's many different formulations out there. They all work the same way by decreasing the swelling or inflammation associated with allergic rhinitis. Um, they have different scents. Some of them are wet and some of them are dry sprays now. Um, so sometimes we experiment to see what the patient wants to use. Um, I have to be honest and say that many um, young boys and even older boys won't use nasal sprays. They just outright don't use them. Um, so I really spend a lot of time talking to patients about what the options are and what are you going to be most likely to use. Because if I write a prescription and I know it's a good medicine, but yet they're not going to use it, they're not going to get better. So I want to know that up front. So I try to be very open with them and say a lot of people may not like certain type of things or they might prefer one over another. So what do you think you'd do best with? Uh, we actually have combination nasal sprays with antihistamines in now. So you get, just like with asthma, you can get two medicines in one inhaler. We have that for allergies. Monte Lucas, that tablet of oxlucotrine, is also approved for allergic rhinitis. It really seems to be effective for congestion, post-nasal drip, and cough. It's less effective for that uh, runny nose and sneezing, and it also has efficacy against eye symptoms. So that's usually one of my treatments of choice in patients that don't want to use a nasal spray. Um, plain old saline, either saltwater drops sprayed up the nose, or if you want to do saline irrigation, um, that is helpful in many people. Now, some people don't like the sensation of irrigation, but some do. And the saline nasal drops are quite easy to use. They're inexpensive over the counter. The salt water has um, anti-inflammatory properties, and it also rinses both the allergens and then the allergy chemicals away. Um, you know, so if you have a family that really is resistant to wanting to be on meds, you want to go trying to control the environment using something like saline, that's a possibility. Um, we also have an over-the-counter nasal spray called Chromalin Nasal Prom. Um, it's over-the-counter because it's very safe and it does work, but the only problem is it needs to be used three or four times every day to work. Um, most of the nasal sprays we prescribe are once or twice a day and people are more, more compliant with them. Uh, the nasal crom is an option if they're worried about steroid side effects, um, despite your best efforts to educate them. Um, you know, that's an option as well as saline. That's the only reason I put them up there. Um, allergy immunotherapy is very exciting right now. It's potentially curative. About 90% of patients who go on allergy shots and stick with it will be cured in three to five years. Um, it can be tedious. If you go on allergy shots, you're going to initially be going in to see your doctor every week for several months and then once a month for several years. Um, and there's a risk of anaphylaxis with the shots and they're painful and they're inconvenient to come in and get. But they do work if you go on them and you stick with them. Um, we also, in the last few years, have had immunotherapy developed that can be administered sublingually as a drop under the tongue. I'm sorry, as a tablet under the tongue. We have three formulations approved in the United States right now. Two of these are for grass, allergy, and one is for ragweed. And what we typically do is the patients who um, want to go on immunotherapy but don't want to inconvenience or the risk of shots, they'll think about this. So if you're grass allergic or ragweed allergic, you would actually start these tablets, which are available by prescription. You would actually start them three to four months before your season and take them under the tongue each day, um, once a day, and then continue till the end of that season. And the studies are suggesting, again, after about three years of that seasonal treatment, you will be cured. Um, so the advantage to this is only the first dose is given in the office, and then the other doses um, are taken at home. Um, you don't have to worry about the inconvenience of running in to see the doctor. Um, it's also not going to give you immediate relief, just like the shots don't give you immediate relief. It takes time. Um, but it really is exciting to us because it is a new you know, form of, of cure. 
Um, I want to leave you with just a few take-home points. Um, asthma is very serious. Um, it's very prevalent, particularly in the minorities. It does result in significant morbidity and mortality, and that's very unfortunate because we have good doctors and we have good medications to control it. So if we could take our time and appropriately educate people about the treatment and help them learn to stay on their controllers, we could actually prevent a lot of the problems and even deaths due to asthma. Um, allergic rhinitis is a little bit different. It's very bothersome. It impacts upon asthma and ear infections and sinus infections, but no one's going to die from it. But if you do have allergic rhinitis, it can be miserable. Um, a lot of times avoidance of triggers is difficult, but we try our best to educate them. Um, the bottom line for both of these diseases is that we do have a wide range of effective medications available, so really no one should be suffering. And then, um, again, the most exciting thing, I think, is that immunotherapy, including the sublinguals, not just the injected, is potentially curative in many patients for allergic rhinitis. Um, I want to leave you with a few thoughts. Um, everyone really needs to raise the bar on what they expect for asthma control. These patients should be active, they should be sleeping, they shouldn't be missing work or school, and they shouldn't be going to the emergency room. Um, we really try to get that message across that if you're taking your controller once or twice a day as prescribed, we want all these good, excellent outcomes for you. And if we're not achieving them, we need to know so that we can do some adjustments. Um, really, it can be life-changing if you control their disease. Um, and then finally, I touched upon some of the new and emerging treatments for both asthma and allergic rhinitis. Again, we have those different biologic injections available for the severe asthmatics that are transforming some of their lives. And then we have immunotherapy available in sublingual form, um, you know, to help cure allergies. Um, so with that, I'm going to go and end, and I thank everyone for their um, attention and, um, you know, hope that I left you with a um, significant amount of knowledge on how to approach both asthma and allergic rhinitis. Thank you. As a reminder, this is the fourth training in this five-part web series as shown on the screen. The first three trainings are available now. Please stay tuned for our next topic, food allergies, which will launch on the site in October 2016. Again, I'd like to thank Dr. Gentile for lending her expertise on asthma and allergies, and thank you, our listeners, for participating with this online training. If you should have any questions regarding this training or any future offerings, please contact Penn State Pro Wellness. Our email address is on the screen. Thank you again.